If you ask a property millionaire how they achieved their success, they'll probably say something like, work hard, be patient, and think long term. And this is true, but surely there's more to it than that. After all, lots of people work hard, but how many of them do you see driving around in Ferraris? Well, over the past decade we've spent in the industry, we've witnessed the creation of property millionaires firsthand. And from observing them, we put together a list of specific tangible rules that you can start using today to kickstart your journey to that magic million. 1. Build an inner circle In the world of stock market investing, you often hear about the lone genius. They'll sit on their own reading company reports all day, sit back, think deeply, and then occasionally make bold and incredible moves that pay off big, based on nothing but their own cleverness and insight. In the world of property, you never hear stories like this, because they don't exist. Yes, you do need to be switched on, but property is a multiplayer game, and the difference between success and struggle is often the team that you've built. The exact members of the team that you need will depend on your strategy. For example, if you're gonna be refurbishing or flipping properties, then having a skilled and reliable builder is absolutely critical. On the other hand, our clients are more hands-off, so they need a sourcing agent like us to locate and negotiate on the ideal properties for them to acquire. But there are three team members that everyone is going to need. The first is an accountant. And let's be real, one way or another, you are going to end up paying a lot of tax, but you could pay a lot less tax if you've got someone to help you structure your deals correctly in the first place and then make sure you're claiming everything that you can. Second is a solicitor because with property there are lots of potential risks and issues that you'd never be able to spot on your own. For example in our Sunday Times column we hear all the time from people who've got into trouble with properties that have a ground rent that double every 10 years that a decent solicitor would never have allowed them to buy in the first place. And thirdly there's a mortgage broker not just to help you get the best deal although that will save you thousands of pounds in its so right, but also to act as a sounding board. My broker has saved me from doing deals that I shouldn't by spotting things I've missed because she sees thousands of transactions every year so has a very trained eye. So with that inner circle in place, it's time to go out and look for properties to build up your millionaire portfolio. Two, optimize for capital growth. Let's say you go and buy a property that looks solid. It's gonna produce a good rental income, but the area it's in is not that exciting. Let's say that over 10 years, it grows in value by an average of 2% per year. So assuming you bought a property worth 300,000 pounds by putting in 100,000 pounds worth of your own money, after 10 years, the value of that property has got up to 365,000 pounds. That's 65,000 pounds worth of extra equity for you which isn't bad considering you've had rental income too. But what if you managed to spot an area that was on the up, that was going to grow by an unusually high amount? Well, then say that this property also produced a good rental income, but grew by 6% per year on average. Well, then this property would be worth £488,000 after 10 years. That's £188,000 worth of equity in your pocket from buying a property of the same value. So you can see how buying in the right place makes a big difference to your future millionaire status. Having the market work for you is a huge advantage because your equity grows and you can use it in the future to buy more properties or to just cash out and enjoy. But can your choice of area really make such a big difference as in my example? Well, yes it can. If we go back and look at what's happened since January 2018, property prices in London have grown by just 8.5%. In Manchester, they've grown by 38%. That is a huge difference. How did it come about? Well, a lot of it is to do with regeneration. Manchester has had big companies, including the BBC and ITV, moving many of their operations there, which has drawn in talented people, which has caused new leisure facilities and infrastructure to be built, which has drawn in more people again, and so the virtuous cycle goes on. If I had to pick just one thing to look for, it would be improved transport links, especially rail links. An obvious example of this is London's Crossrail, where property prices at the furthest ends of the route have gone up far faster than anywhere else because it's now commutable into London when previously it wasn't. And you don't have to be early. No one's going to buy in an area because a project has just been announced and it means they're going to be able to get to work more easily in 10 years time. You can buy into areas when they're clearly on the up and already improving. There are not many prizes for being too early. Three, understand the 18 year property cycle. So being in the right place makes a big difference to your chances of becoming a property millionaire. But the other critical factor is buying at the right time. And we've been guided for over a decade now by a concept called the 18 year property cycle. The theory goes, and you can track the pattern back for hundreds of years, that property goes up in price for 14 years more slowly for the first seven and much more rapidly for the second seven before crashing and dropping back down again until a bottom is hit 
four years later. Each cycle starts from a higher point than the last, so if you just hold all the way through, you will come out ahead. But you can do even better if you let the cycle guide you to be a bit more clever with your timing. Now, I'm not going to recommend that you sit and don't do anything until 2026, which is when fans of the theory believe that the market is going to peak. This might seem like the ideal thing to do, but the trouble is the 18-year path is just an average, and you can't guarantee it's going to play out that way. And in any case, it's hard to have that much conviction. You can always argue your way out of following it. People have been saying that the cycle is broken and that the market is just about to crash since 2016. But what you can do is make use of the cycle to determine when to be aggressive and when to be defensive. For example, I own several properties that I really shouldn't have bought in the first place and would rather not own anymore. So at some point when there's a boom, everyone's excited about property and you can sell anything to anyone. I know that that's the perfect time for me to be offloading those properties at a good price. What the people who don't know about the cycle will be doing at that point will be buying those properties off me, overpaying in their excitement and then seeing prices crash back down again. When prices do seem to be high and we could be coming towards the end of the cycle, I'll still be buying, but I'll be making sure that I buy quality assets in quality areas that are likely to come out of the crash strongly once the panic has passed. And of course, keeping a little bit of cash on the sidelines ready to hoover up some bargains while everyone else is panicking. The 18-year property cycle isn't something to stick to slavishly, but as a framework, it's so valuable, especially when you combine it with this next technique. Four, study Monopoly. Everyone loved Monopoly growing up. However, playing real life Monopoly is slightly different because in order to become a property millionaire, you don't actually want to own that many properties. Because however good your team and however well you outsource, each extra property is an extra potential source of hassle. It's an extra tenant that could go rogue and an extra boiler that could break. Now, there is a sweet spot. You wouldn't want to have all your wealth tied up in one mega mansion, but I would far rather have a smaller number of more expensive, higher quality properties than a larger number of cheaper ones adding up to the same amount of equity. Now, if you can buy this type of property from the start, that's great, but I didn't, and in practice, very few people do. Often, it's because you can only afford the cheaper properties at first, and it's far better to just get started than to wait for years until you can afford that Park Lane hotel. Or it's because you get seduced into buying cheaper properties at first, because on paper, they produce a higher yield, which is a mistake that no one is immune to. But over time, just like in Monopoly, you can gradually trade up. Trading those houses for hotels, making use of the 18-year property cycle as you do so, to operate in a pattern that is counter to the rest of the market. Sell your weaker assets into a hot market and use quieter markets to snap up quality assets at a discount. But then, as many people with rogue siblings have found out when playing Monopoly for real, rules are there to be broken. Five, if it's not broken, don't fix it. I know people who do own large numbers of cheaper houses and they do extremely well out of it. It's not the approach that I would take, but that's the great thing about property. There are so many ways to make it work, depending on your own skills, preferences, goals, and circumstances. I often warn about the hidden dangers of buying cheaper properties because it's a trap that I've fallen into and I've seen it happen to other people too. But if you're already doing something and it's working for you, then keep doing it. In property, there are no points for style or originality. In many ways, the ideal way of investing is to have a cookie cutter process, find a model that works and repeat it exactly the same way again and again and again. Once you're a property millionaire, you can go get your thrills on the ski slopes or from having private flying lessons. You don't have to get your excitement from your investments. Six, get the hometown advantage. It's no secret that location is important when it comes to property. A famous TV show kind of made that point. So having a hometown advantage can be huge for you as an investor. If you're able to invest near where you live, this is a giant shortcut because you'll already know the areas that are more desirable, those that are up and coming, and those that might look attractive to outsiders, but have hidden drawbacks that you're already wise to. And as you'll know from your own area, you build up knowledge over time that no online tool or database is ever going to be able to match. For example, example, seemingly identical three bedroom houses are actually bigger on this street than the parallel one. Or on a longer road, there's this invisible boundary where an area you'd want to live in morphs into one you'd rather avoid. And a property might look close to the station on a map, but you know that it's not a route that anyone would feel comfortable walking at night. This local knowledge can guide you towards the best areas and away from potential problems. But let's be realistic. Investing locally isn't going to work for everyone. If you're living in the Southeast, for example, your local area might not work because properties are too expensive or yields are too low or the growth potential just isn't there. Or maybe you're living overseas and you don't have a local area in the UK. But that's not a problem because you 
you can replicate the hometown advantage with a solid research process, even for an area that's hundreds of miles away. There are countless tools and techniques you can use to do this, but here are three of my favorites. Firstly, Google Street View. It's so easy to pick up clues about what an area is like just by virtually walking the streets. I found in the past that I've researched an area, then later visited in person and thought, why did I even bother coming here? I already knew everything I needed to, just from using Street View. Secondly, there's streetcheck.co.uk. If Google Street View is the vibes, Street Check is the facts. It's got a phenomenal amount of data about the demographic makeup of an area, local amenities, local crime, and plenty more. And thirdly, there's local message boards. If you search for an area on either Reddit or Mumsnet, which are two of my favorites, you'll find that people who live locally are not shy about sharing the places that they love and the places they wouldn't park their car. So once you've identified an area and built up your knowledge, well, what should you be buying? That's where the next millionaire tactic comes in. Seven, hunt for standout homes. It's often said that you should start anything with the end in mind. And the ability to do this in property separates the people with a little extra side income from the ones who built up life-changing levels of wealth. So how do you do that? Well, at some point, you're going to want to sell a property, cash in your gains, and tearfully delete it from your portfolio spreadsheet. And when that day comes, there is one outcome that you want more than any other, and that is a bidding war. Property is unique in the extent to which people buy with their emotions. And if you've got two buyers who desperately want to make it their home, they can end up paying far more than even your most optimistic estimates. So how do you achieve this outcome? Well, to an extent, it is just luck, but there's also something you can do to engineer a higher likelihood of it happening. And that is buying something unique. Think about it. If you buy a terraced house on an ordinary street, chances are, whenever you want to sell, there will be at least one other very similar home up for sale at the same time. So if two buyers come along, well, they can just have one each, no bidding war. And if only one buyer comes along, then even worse, they can play you and the other seller off against each other to get a lower price for themselves. But what if you've got the only house on the street with a big garden, or in development, you've got the only penthouse unit? Well, then you are one of one, and it's far more likely that multiple people People will want what you have and will be willing to outbid each other to get it. Now, don't get me wrong, not every property in your portfolio needs to be some incredible standout. Mine certainly are. But if you have the chance and you can buy something that is in some way special, even if the rental return you get from it is a little lower, you'll find it does wonders for your equity by the time you come to sell. Eight, don't trust estate agents. When you come to buy that special property, you'll almost certainly be interacting with someone in that process. And that someone is an estate agent. If they're any good at their job, they'll treat you like their best friend. And a good agent can be extremely useful for getting information from, but remember, they're not on your side. You should verify anything that they tell you. For example, if they tell you what they think a property will rent for, don't take their word for it. Go onto Rightmove or Zoopla, search for similar properties that are nearby, and find out for yourself. If they tell you that a property has had loads of interest and you should put in an offer right now if you're interested, well, install a browser extension like Property Tracker or Property Log. This will tell you how long the property's been on the market for and if the price has been cut. If the property's been sitting there for a month and they've just taken £10,000 off the asking price, their claims about how everyone's beaten down their door are probably not true. Nine, vet your tenants. So you've handled the estate agent like a pro and you've bought that special property in a fast growing area. But if you're gonna make it all the way to that magic million, there is one last thing that you must do. And that is to vet your tenants thoroughly. We write a weekly advice column in the Sunday Times and we're bombarded with questions from people who are having trouble with tenants who are paying or who cause horrendous damage or have even rented out each room of the house to someone else. And in almost every case, it could have been avoided if they'd referenced their tenants properly in the first place. Do you? Use your gut feeling. It can be very powerful, but use that as a first filter and then back it up with rock solid references. I'm not saying this to scare you because tenants will cause so much damage to undo all the benefits of capital growth or that a loss of rental income will destroy the returns that you had in mind. I'm saying it because the biggest risk is that the hassle and the drama will make you give up on the whole idea, sell out and invest in something less emotionally draining. Because while you absolutely can become a property millionaire, it's not gonna happen overnight. You need to stay in the game. And the best way to do that is to make it easy for yourself because the stress and the drama is immediate and it's painfully obvious, yet the gains happen slowly and stealthily in the background. So the biggest danger is you give up before you should. So now you've got a set of rules that will eventually earn you that coveted millionaire status. However, understanding the rules is one thing, but when you come to put them into action, there's one big danger that can stop you in your tracks, and that 
is uncertainty. Thing is, most wannabe investors get stuck because there's something they just can't figure out. Even with a crystal clear vision of the outcome, they hit a roadblock, give up, and the dream slowly fades. So to avoid that all too common fate, watch this video next, where I walk you through exactly how to translate these rules into simple, actionable steps. 